each and every one of you guys, as well as you ladies. It is a great day. It's Monday. I'm actually headed to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, at Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there is the Lancaster Lime Works, a company that's been in business for a long, long time that knows about historic houses. We're, of course, working on the red brick house that was built in 1820. Uh, the thing that's interesting about working on old houses, you can't necessarily do things the same way as you would with modern uh, technology and modern materials. You need to go back through and con. For example, when I first got the house, there were two sections on the front of the house where the bricks were just blown out. And so when you saw this, you looked at it and said, this place is going to fall down. Well, there's a couple of reasons why this had happened. A, the rain gutters had been uh, not in place. So the water kept splashing up on the same spots over and over for years, saturating the bricks. When the winter, of course, came, the bricks are saturated. Um, the freezing, the thawing, they basically broke. Enter the city who owned the house. Well, we need to fix the bricks. They ended up bringing in regular bricks, which now are hardened bricks. The bricks now, modern bricks, are hard. They don't expand and contract like the old ones. The old bricks were soft, and the lime mortar that they use is almost like putty. It expands and contracts together with the bricks. When they put the regular mortar, which again is rock hard, with the regular bricks, the expansion between the heat and the cold of the old bricks versus the new ones literally made the bricks rejected. It literally, just like a kidney that's got the wrong blood type transplant, it literally pushed the bricks out. And that's why you have this hole in the front of it. We hence have gotten, uh, years ago, a brick mason who came in. We found some uh, Williamsburg bricks, handmade bricks. There. They're actually a softer brick. And ended up repairing it. Looks great now, even though the gutters aren't repaired. It's flashing. And so that's the lesson learned that you must use like materials. Well, the inside of the house, we have the bricks that are plastered with a lime plaster. Excuse me, I'm trying to get over here. With a lime plaster. And we're going to re-plaster the walls. And here again is another one of these crazy things. Most of it is actually in really, really good shape. The places where the plaster is actually coming off were places where there was a moisture issue because the roof had roof leaks. And as I go through on the second floor, I can see a section over the doorway where it's bad and it goes on through. And again, that's because of the moisture that's on there. So, trying to do this project the right way that it'll last for hopefully another 200 years, we're actually going to use lime plaster. Now, you can go on Amazon and you can buy little 10-pound bags of it where it's like a hundred and some odd dollars, uh, which would not be cost-effective. Well, Limeworks actually has five-gallon buckets of it that's pre-mixed, um, ready to pretty much go um, for $50 for a five-gallon bucket. Now, if you order a pallet of 24, you can get it delivered pay for the shipping. But instead, I'm actually going to go to Lancaster Lime Works today because after talking to them on the phone, I have to meet these guys. I've seen a couple of their videos and things, and they're basically telling you everything you need to know about putting on there. Because see, I didn't know there's actually a coarse lime mortar that you actually, excuse me, lime plaster that you put on first, which takes care of the deep wells and things in there. And then there is actually a marble dust fine one that goes on top. And the guy was telling me, you got to make sure you don't put on more than about the thickness of a credit card per swipe when you put it on because it'll crack. So we're going to go today and learn a little bit about lime plastering. Can't wait. Players that fit with my game. 
Hurts has signed an extension with the Philadelphia Eagles. It is a lot of money, makes him the highest paid player for the moment. You know how it works in the NFL, the next big contract. He'll be the highest paid guy in the league. All right, so we're actually here, and they're actually mixing some mortar right now. Um, see me, I'm the village idiot. I'm going to go ahead and get the pre-mixed stuff. Man. Not too much, man. This guy is from Virginia. He just pulled okay. in. Yeah. And he well, wants to do some. He's, not, he's new to line. So I am definitely. You? Well, I've got some guys that are going to do it. That uh, are going to work on it. So, but I'm trying to make sure I know everything as much as possible. We're in the same boat, man. Okay. How old is the place you working on? Uh, about 200. About 200? Yeah. That's what I got. I got a, 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 what was originally a schoolhouse. Okay. 1820. Okay. And so we're uh, got some plastic that needs to be repaired. Oh, so that's mixing it. Okay. These are different types of finish top coats mm -hmm. that are made out of our products. But there's a different recipe for each one and a different finishing technique. So the world of finished plasters is mm -hmm. as diverse as the recipes for bread. You're dealing with whole wheat bread, white bread, sourdough bread, pumpernickel bread. Is it dark? Is it light? Is it fluffy? Is it da da da? da, da, da. It gets really complex really, really fast. So we do have some basic mixes that we can give to you that, right. that, that are good for you to get started. But I'm going to just throw out right at the beginning. Uh -oh. I'm going to throw out right at... No, no, this is easy. i throw out right at the beginning that you're, you're going to want to do some mock-ups. Mm -hmm. Do some test patches. You're going to learn through the failure to finesse what is going to be the right thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, our 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 basic plaster training class is two days. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have time to cover two days worth of stuff in the next hour or whatever we have time here. So, but but don't be intimidated by it. If you're not afraid to fail, let it fail. Oh, trust me. And 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 yes, keep on going. Me. So mm -hmm. so you kind of get where I'm going at. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to jump around too quick. And, and so on and so forth. But the, so the basic principle is one of the things you'll notice right away, the base coat has larger aggregate. Mm -hmm. The top coat has smaller aggregate. So the, the, the basic principle is the thicker the coat, the bigger the aggregate, the thinner the coat, the smaller the aggregate. Okay. Um, this is on wood lath. Mm -hmm. The base coat that you put on wood lath first, if you're going on wood lath or on top of directly on masonry, you want to put some horse hair in it. Okay. We can't add horse hair ahead of time because the high pH of the lime will digest the hair. And then okay. it'll it'll putrefy, it'll totally digest, and then you'll have nothing in it. So you, you have, have to add it right before. Do you have the horse we hair? Have, we have horse okay. hair, yeah. So you want to add it right before you you um, put the put the plaster on the wall. Okay. And only mix what you're going to use within the next day because the, the hair literally... When I'm mixing something with the H1 binder, I, that's why I wear a hat because... I'll go in and take a shower if I don't, and the, hair, the, my, the lime would have settled over my hair, and I'll take a shower, and a bunch of my hair will fall out because mm. it, it, it digests my hair. So always wear a hat when you're if you're working with the stuff that's a dry powder. Okay. If you're mixing with a pre wet, it's not, it's there's not, no, it's nothing going to go air okay. form. You're not going to have an issue. But we have lots of different types, mm -hmm. so we have the ingredients to make a lot of different things. So they like going to a bakery store. We have might have different types of yeast, different flours, different sugars, different salts different technique techniques to make stuff and so we have the ingredients and then okay. we also have some premix so we have mm -hmm. both of them but a lot of people like to to, to get the premix some people like to experiment with the, the premix you know i'm going to trust your mixing better than mine that's what i'm okay. <laughs> yeah. okay uh definitely with the sand coat i mean yeah. that, watching the, your videos base, and stuff yeah. on the base i'm sorry the base coat mm -hmm. Um, watching it, the the stickiness in there mm -hmm. is actually oh, amazing incredible. me how much, I mean, it literally stuck it's stuck to the wall. It's incredible stuff, yeah. Um, the thing I'm concerned with is, you know, the bricks are in pretty good shape that are behind there. Um, in places where the bricks are loose, I've taken care of the mortar on them. Um, but it is very, very dry. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll need to wet it. You have to get it plenty wet. And a couple foundational principles for how much water it takes mm -hmm. is understanding how much water does an old brick hold i have a little video on a website that that shows you i it's, it's me literally there's no sound to it i take i take a video um i take a slow 
shot video, and I take a pan of water, I put two cups of water in it, and I stick a brick down in it. Mm -hmm. And it takes three and a half hours for the water to wick to the top of the brick. Okay? For the water to wick all the way wow. to the top of the brick. Okay. So I take the brick out, and I measure how much water is left in there, because I want to know how much water is actually mm -hmm. holding in a brick, right? So that brick held one and three quarter cups of water. It's a lot of water. So if you start doing the math, wow. if you have 600 bricks, you're going to be holding about a 55 gallon drum of water, 600 bricks. Wow. And that excludes the mortar joints. So it's actually higher than that. 1200 bricks is going to be 120 gallons of water. It's insane the amount of water it holds. So here's where, here's where it gets tricky. Mm -hmm. When they're building these homes originally, the bricks were damp, they were outside, they weren't totally dry. And if they were dry, they would get them wet. And then they'd lay with wet mortar. And then they'd plaster on top of a wet wall because it was wet, right? Mm -hmm. Now the wall has been sitting there 200 years. This is dry as a bone. Mm -hmm. That's my wall. So we're going to do the calculation of how much water it's going to put in there. What most people do is they get a, a pump-up garden sprayer, and mm -hmm. they missed it, and they go, there, it's wet enough. No. When you start adding up how much water these bricks hold, you need to do the calculation of how many gallons that is. And in order to actually do that, what I suggest is first kind of get an idea how many bricks it is, take your hose, Mm -hmm. on that fine mist spray yeah hold it into a five gallon bucket and watch the time how long is it going to take for you to fill a five gallon bucket of water at that mist if it takes 10 minutes that means 10 minutes of spraying on the wall is going to get five gallons of water in the wall and you've got a long and you have a, if you're trying to put 100 gallons of water in the wall it's a lot of water now wow. here here's the key mm -hmm. you don't have to get the brick totally saturated you need to get it wet in a good two inches, inch and a half, two inches in. You don't need the whole thing wet, okay? So you you are backing that saturated brick number, that gallons, you're backing that down. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be totally wet, okay? Right. So that, that's important. So just throw that out of your mind. We don't have to put 1,200 gallons of water in a wall. But you do need to realize that... That's not good enough. It's not enough. Mm -mm. So you're putting it on until the water stops flash drying. I go on and I spray the wall 24 hours ahead. Mm -hmm. Then I'll spray it 12 hours ahead. And then I'll spray it again right before I put it on. So it gives a chance for the water to kind of work back. You know, you, you don't just put it on and start going. You really need to get it down. And if you don't do that, it ain't gonna stay up there. What happens if you if you put the more, the, if, so um, I, I, that's a really, really good question. M modern materials, Portland cement, mm -hmm. gypsum plasters, most plasters that you get that are modernly available everywhere are like a glue. Mm -hmm. they're, they're gluing onto the wall. Natural lime plasters do not glue onto the wall. They stick to the wall through what's called the suction action of water. This is the oh. most critical part for you to understand uh -huh. for your base coats and your top coats. They're not gluing. They're, as the water is sucking in, that's what gives it the adhesion. Gotcha. Okay. So, so here's the key. You get your base about the same, your, your brick, the same moisture content as your plaster. Because if you're putting your plaster on a dry wall, the little bit of water that is in that plaster will wick into the brick because it's dry. Yeah. And then that connection between the brick and the plaster will turn to powder. And there'll be no connection. It'll fall off. So you, okay. you see where I'm going yeah, for the foundation? Exactly, yeah. So when we're up there and you're like, can, can you tell how does it we do that? Like, no, we got to give you the foundational <laughs> part you yeah. so you can understand what we're doing. Plenty wet so that, because if it falls off, it's not a plaster problem. Mm -hmm. the, prob the, the problem is that your substrate's too wet. Too, I mean, it's not it's, wet it's enough. not wet enough. That's right. So what you're doing is your base, your bricks, your wood lath, your stone, whatever wall you're putting it on. Mm -hmm is drying at the same rate as your plaster and and they dry together and they stick right makes sense that's that's the critical part to mm -hmm. understand the top coats the same way mm -hmm. so you want to have a, a rough sandy surface see this is the base coat i'm sorry yeah. i don't have a larger base no coat no here, no this is great this is the base coat right yeah. here see it's rough mm -hmm. it's sandy i achieved that look by using a wood float okay so i have a wood float and i can show you and so after you put this stuff on um, you're you're flattening it with a wood float, mm -hmm. and then um, you're you're flattening it with a wood float. Um, 
you're, 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 you don't finish the base with a steel trowel because mm -hmm. the steel brings the lime to the surface and then it's, you want the lime back okay. in the wall. So you're only doing it with a, um, with a wood trowel. You're only doing it with a wood float. Yeah. I may ask if these guys need anything. Okay. Of trades that are lacking is plaster. <laughs> I can believe that. Traditional plasters. Yeah. And lime mortars. They're both. 97 and 96 percent there nobody there's nobody around that does it so okay. my goal is training i'm willing to spend as much time with you or your mason to help you learn the basics of it but i love this but guy. just but just remember <laughs> uh -huh. that it's not for the faint of heart and mm -hmm. don't be afraid to fail because it will fail in fact you're going to learn more through failure than you are through you know success if it's going really well all the time and so uh, our 100% our natural plasters do not stick on drywall mm -hmm. because there's not the suction action there. If you get drywall wet, it's going to come apart. It delaminates, it mm -hmm. falls apart, and you'll never get anything to stick. So that's where your 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 100% natural plasters. If if you find a a, um, a lime company that advertises that you can use their products on top of drywall, they're lying. Automatically you. know it's not natural. Okay. That you they have to put something in it to get it to glue. And that, that thing is usually called methyl cellulose. Methyl cellulose is a glue. It's a powder that comes from digesting trees. So they call it a plant-based binder. Mm -hmm. But ethanol, you know what ethanol yeah. is? Ethanol is plant-based, but you wouldn't want it in your living room. Good point. Okay. So, so it doesn't make sense to advertise 100% all-natural material when and it's plant-based, but I wouldn't want ethanol in my house. So. It's deceiving in my mind, but if you're going with 100% natural materials, they only adhere through the suction action of water. They do well, not. We're glue perfect on, on this because it's going on these old bricks, you know, exactly. that are the original from it. The stuff is amazing to work with. It sticks mm -hmm. on. It works on your tools. The stuff's incredible, but if you don't understand the foundational of the suction action of of the water of the of the adhesion, all that stuff, you're gonna say some really bad words and you're gonna hate me. Because you have to understand the foundational <laughs> part of it. Well, well, working on this house, of course, I, I'm, I'm uh, a carpenter. And uh, of course, that's another one of those dying trades mm -hmm. and used to dealing with a lot of old, old stuff. So mm -hmm. um, this is something new for me, but I, I love the challenge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So your base, so when you go to do your top coat, um, well, let, let's start over. Your base coat on lath has to have horse hair. Mm -hmm. The horse hair acts as rebar, mm -hmm. and I can tell you how much I can tell you how you how you put the hair in it and all that kind of stuff, about in a second. But you put the base coat on, on the lath. Let it set up generally overnight. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if it's cool and damp, it might take a couple days. But generally on a warm day, sunny like this, it, it it's carbonating, and and as the water is leaving, the carbon dioxide dioxide's pulled carbon dioxide cool in. Okay. So it's not setting as a hydraulic set. So it's, okay. it's drying, it's a carbonating, and it, it, it doesn't ever dry in the, or doesn't ever set in the bucket because carbon dioxide can't get to it. So it only starts to carbonate once you put it on. And as the water leaves, the CO is pulled in. The water leaves, the CO is pulled in. And it's that exchange, and then it carbonates and set up there. People say, how long will it take to set? When can I go on to the next round? I did that. I, I, don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I literally, when I'm doing a formal training class, I'll take a, a towel, a beach towel, dip it in a five gallon bucket of water and I'll hand it to you. Okay. And I ask you, how long is it going to take for that? How long will it take for that towel to dry? How long will it take for that towel to dry? Uh, if, if it's to dry? out in the sun, might help. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Exactly. I how long is it going to take to dry? Okay. I don't know. Now how can you tell that it's going to be dry enough? It starts to lighten up. Um, and it becomes thumbprint hard, so you can push on it, and it and it, it doesn't leave a thumbprint. Okay. It can still be wet, mm -hmm. but but it's hard enough that you can push a half decent pressure on it, and it doesn't leave a thumbprint, and then you're good to go. Okay. All right. Now, so then when we start getting to um, our fine coats, now I remember. So then, so you that's saying... that's the horsehair plaster. Right. Then that's the first base coat. Okay. Um, then you put a second base coat on top of that. Okay. So we're building then, it up. You're building it up. The, the first one is to kind of get the, the first adhesion to your base. Mm -hmm. The second one is the flattening coat. Will we end up moisturizing this again? If it dries out, yes. Uh, before we do the next coat. Yes. Okay. You moisturize it again. It's a great way to put it. You moisturize it <laughs> the wall. Yeah. Um, just, so, sure, you're misting it so it's all the same color. You don't want a light and a dark and a light and a... You want the whole thing the same color. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that means that the moisture content's about the same through the whole thing. Okay. Then you put on your second coat. Again, minimum three eighths. You can go up to an inch if you need to. And what you're doing is your um, that's your flattening coat. Mm -hmm. And there you take your straight edge and you're running your straight edge up the wall and it's flattening it. Because the top coat is not a flattened coat. Right. You want your base coat to be as flat as flat as, as the final coat. Now I was watching one of the videos. You're, you're not flatting it with a with a trowel. Oh, um, I, I, it was actually really interesting because you guys were doing a video where you had kind of a um, the wall was kind of strangely shaped, okay. and you had a wood trowel that they kept putting putting more on it, and just taking the wood trowel okay. that followed the pattern of it to try and build up that shape. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Whatever it takes to get it on the but wall. But the key is this has to be wood when you're putting that sand coat on it, the trowel. Do not use the metal one because the lime will come to the surface, correct? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, and you want your lime back in the wall. Right. And you need to have a rough surface for the top coat to stick to. You don't want it smooth. Is that true with the the fine coat, with the metal trowel? Is what true? Should uh, Do you do that with the wood trowel as well? The finish? Are we wood float the finish no. coat, or you can do that with the metal? We usually... You, what you do is, you, you keep jumping ahead of me. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay, because I want to make sure we're going step by step by okay. step so we don't have to go back. So with a base coat with hair, just to get something on the wall. The second mm -hmm. coat is to flatten it. Okay. Okay. Once that's flattened, um, you're going over it with a wood float. Just Then you're misting the wall again so it's all the same color, mm -hmm. right? Then you're taking your top coat. Right. On, and I went like that because I'm pretending I'm taking it off on, off my <laughs> off my hawk and on, onto the trowel. Um, and then you're putting it on about that thick. Credit card thickness. Or thinner, okay. thin as you can. Actually, you're almost putting it on and you're and you're trying to take off as much as you can. Okay. And, and you I... can do you can do a big section. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to take. We have um, a blue sponge. Um, it's, it's called a sponge float. Uh -huh. You're going to get your blue sponge float, blue sponge float, stick it in a five gallon bucket of water, kind of get most of the water off, but not all of it, and you're sponging it. And you're going to keep cleaning the sponge and you're going to keep sponging it. And that's okay. the finished coat. Now, that sponge is going to make somewhat of a rough surface. It's yeah. not going to be super smooth. But if you don't do that, it's going to crack like crazy. If you only keep going over it with your steel trowel, to try to get it flat yeah. and work the cracks out um, because lime flat finish coats, are, like I said, are the most complex mm -hmm. to, to put on. Once you get the hang of it, it's easy, but at the beginning, it's difficult. If you use a steel trowel, you end up leaving a lot of burnish marks. Right. And if you end up having some of these gray, there's a couple, like right there, that's a burnish mark. Okay. You don't want those, you don't want those, you want it to be white, you just, or whatever mm -hmm. color you want it to be, right? You don't yeah. want a burnish mark. Um, so you're, if you want to have it super, super flat, mm -hmm. it's a trick of getting the, pl the finish coat at just the right time, and then you can put your steel trowel over it, stainless. We like to use mm -hmm. a stainless trowel. Or you could use a stone, and that's where the, the Tadillac stones come in, where you get a little pump up like a, a, a Windex, a Tadillac stone. I have okay. some up there, I'll show you. Um, <laughs> it's a, we may, I make my own Tadillac stones. Okay. Um, we get a rock from Madagascar, and I cut it down and I polish them. Um, it's seven in the moon's hardness scale, and so that you can polish it, but not leave burnish marks. Okay. Because the steel will leave those gray marks where if you use a really hard, smooth rock, it doesn't. And then you can actually wow. get your, you can get your your smooth finishes. And there's a um, lot to this. There's a lot to it, yeah. So you're, but don't be afraid of it. Oh, I'm not afraid. All right. <laughs> I'm not afraid. Now, the other thing is, Yeah. you have, some uh, delamination. Yes. Get everything off that's loose. Mm -hmm. Saturate that rough sand mm -hmm. coat. And then just start practicing putting the finished coat on it. Get it plenty wet. Put on the, the finished coat, okay? Try using just the steel trowel without the stone. Okay. The sponge float steel trowel. Yeah. Almost all of those, if you're, you're home, and I can see it from the picture on there, they were all lime washed. Mm -hmm. And you're, you don't ever paint. 
with latex paint over top of these old plaster walls. They're never painted with latex paint. Never. That never. Okay. They're lime washed. Okay. So you can actually get your finished plaster coat with a buildup of lime wash, and it and it just pools the whole wall together. So you're putting on coats of lime wash. And okay. You can tint the lime wash. That's the color where you get the color. Mm -hmm. um, lime wash tends to, well, it all has brush marks on it because it's all brushed on. Mm -hmm. The first layer of lime wash, all the brush marks go um, horizontally. The next, they all go vertically. Okay. And so you're doing a one coat, two coat, three coat, but usually four, five coats of lime wash is what you put on. And then, and then that, all those undulations, all the movement between it all, the lime, you're basically putting on super thin layers of lime in a, in a white in a lime wash form and it brings it all together and then mm -hmm. the whole wall just blends right together so i wouldn't okay. be overly concerned you can't really take the finished coat of plaster that you have mm -hmm. and skim over top of it, it it's not going to want to go because you can't that that top because this of stuff, that it, mm. it's it's too smooth it's okay. nothing's going to want to stick to it because you it's not rough Okay. So you see what I'm saying? But yeah. the lime wash will stick to it, and the wall needs lime washed anyway. Okay, so, so then the, the how going through where I've got a crack and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Then you take, you mix up some of the finished plaster, uh -huh. and you fill in the cracks. Okay. And, and then it'll shrink back, and you might need to do another coat. So do not fill in with the sand, the, 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 the coarse The finished grip. plaster has sand in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, not, not the coarse stuff, though. Right, no. not the coarse stuff. No. Okay. Just a All little right. cracks. You just put on one or two coats, or maybe three coats of the finished plaster. Once it shrinks back, make sure I pull off anything that's loose. Well, okay. Right. Yeah. If you're painting your living room with latex paint, and your child had smeared butter on the living room, the paint's not going to stick. It's not going to stick. Yeah. No. So when you're, it's, it's the same principle. It's if you're trying to put the stuff on and it comes off, it's because it's having an adhesion problem. And we okay. just got to figure out what the adhesion problem was and get it to the point where it will. So how thick is the lime wash? Very thin. It's like water. And it's just brushed on? Brushed on, yeah. And you can thicken it. We have white pigment. We can walk up to the office. And okay. I can, I can right. Well, let's go up to the office and check this out. <laughs> You know, I tell you what, that was a interesting, interesting education. And I have to give a shout out to Jonathan Owens from Limeworks. Um, incredible guy. You know, he as he pointed out that working on uh, lime plastering, there are no lime plasterers anymore. It's a art that unfortunately that nobody, it's a trade nobody gets into because very few people do it. But he is definitely keeping the trade alive and has a wealth of knowledge. They have courses and things for um, doing lime mortaring and stuff. They have retreats and everything else. And he has everything that you need, especially somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. And uh, I will definitely be relying on him in the very near future to go ahead and get more knowledge on how to plaster the house. Now the next step is to actually get through and get started. Um, I have some guys who do drywall and stuff and say, they say they do plaster, but I'm not sure that they know how to do the plaster the way this is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and follow the instructions that you just heard on there and start trying to see if we can actually fix a couple of small places and get the stroke of this before we try to tackle the whole place. Um, in retrospect, what we'll be able to do, at least with the house is it won't prohibit us from being able to get the place done. Um, if we get my plumbing and my electrical inspected and all that, the guys can start hanging drywall and we can start working on the plaster throughout the course of uh, the next month or so and getting that squared away. With the cost of the materials, um, it would be cheaper to be able to just buy the materials and mix it up and then you got to have that right mixer and things like that. Um, for me, it's advantageous to be able to drive up there and get the 50 gallon buckets of the plaster. It is $50 a bucket. But at least me driving up there, it's a nice trip, and I got to see my man, uh, my buddy up there, Alan. Um, it's a nice, beautiful drive up there and asking questions to make sure we know what we're doing. Uh, for example, the lime wash, we found out. Um, <laughs> there's, there's so many things that we learned. 
that you can't just paint plaster like that with latex paint. It's not going to stay on there. So what you actually have to do is a lime wash. And instead of buying a bucket of lime wash, which is like $125, um, what we learned from Jonathan is the lime wash is basically the lime putty five to one. So you end up taking the lime uh, putty and say a five gallon bucket, you put a gallon of the lime putty in the bottom of there and you add about a gallon of water and you just mix it. He, he said, clearly, you don't want to do this where you put all the water in, he said, because it becomes like cottage cheese. So you want to kind of, it's kind of like making gravy. You want to keep adding a little bit more water to it and getting it mixed so that way it loosens it up. So literally, you're making a very, very thin lime putty wash. And you can tint that to the colors that you want because they have the colors and things. And you end up putting that on the walls. So it's not something that you can do just by saying, oh, I'm going to go, you know, get some plaster of Paris and stick it on the walls. No, you got to do it the right way. And there are no shortcuts. Hope you appreciate and enjoyed this. And definitely, if you have a project like me uh, with the lime and stuff, definitely give Jonathan um, at Limeworks. I'll leave uh, the link in the description for their company and stuff. He knows everything and can ship anywhere that you need to go. See you soon.